Hello, everyone. My name is Michal. I hope you've had a great conference so far. I'd like to kick off the afternoon with a topic that lays very close to my heart, and that is immutability. The year is 2001. We have Java at version 1.3. That means we don't have any generics, we don't have any streams, no concurrency utils, very, very simple language. But the language that is getting more and more popular, uh, so popular that many universities around the world are trying to use it as an introductory language for their students. And uh, one of those universities was University of Texas. They wanted to switch from Haskell to Java as an introductory programming language. And one of the UT professors, University of Texas professors, uh, very famous computer scientist Edgar Dijkstra, heard this rumor. He was retired back then. And he wrote a letter because he opposed this decision. He wrote a very short but, but important letter that still flows around the web uh, until this day. In this letter, he noted that facing students with the novelty of functional programming drives home the message that there is more to programming than they thought. And of course, they me they, he meant students, right? They, this message were, was for, for students, but I argue that it also applies to us imperative programmers, because a majority of us, many of us at least, started programming our programming journey with using some imperative language, right? Uh, hacking some toy projects or doing some web pages or, or, or things like that, but usually using an imperative language. So it's more natural to us. So what he was saying is that like exposing ourselves to something different is very important, and we'll learn more about programming this way. So the argument here is that we can learn from other paradigms. Our paradigm, imperative step-by-step -step statement, Edgar Dijkstra said that it was more about operational reasoning. Operational means like you look at your code and you see, okay, here's the statement, he does that, or th this side effect, or maybe it changes this memory cell, uh, things like that. So you just follow your program step, statement by, by statement uh, in an operational fashion, so operational reasoning, while other paradigms like functional or declarative have a different focus. They teach you to uh, focus on relationships between values, right? Not just statements, following statements, but relationships between values. So it's more rigorous this way, and we'll, we'll see how it works very, very soon. Because the first demo, like very simple demo, and it will, will be printing stuff, just printing stuff. I'd like to uh, just look at this demo from a perspective of a like, very beginner, programmer, like what kind of, what the tool that we are using teaches us about programming. And secondly, how declarative programming helps us, uh, helps us think about programs differently. So uh, the demo is REPLs. On the left, you can see the Python REPL. On my right, on your left, Python REPL, and on the right, Scala REPL. So, you know, simple thing like that, two plus two. When you say plus, plus, 2 plus 2, you'll see 4, right? But what happens when you print 2 plus 2? It's 4 again. From the perspective of the user, you don't see any difference. While in other tools, like Scala Ripple, when you say 2 plus 2, you get information what really happened. This is a calculation. This is an expression that produces a new value. Takes one uh, value, 2, and second value, 2, calculates a sum of them, right? It's an integer, its name is rest 6. And when you print something, you get just that. It's printed, right? So there is difference. Even in this smallest possible tool that you use as a programmer, there is a difference in what you see, what you learn about how to program, right? That's the, that's the argument, argument here. If you start by using Python, you miss out because you don't really care about many, many things. So in, in declarative paradigm, you, you see this kind of approach of value in, value out, like throughout the whole software suite. So for example, in Java, you, have, uh, you, you can create a value like string, a, b. String is an immutable value, right? And this is strictly from the paradigm of functional uh, world. 
so, so when you have uh, two strings and you and you just want to concatenate them together, you'll get another value back. Nothing changed. A, B is still uh, the same, C, D is still the same. You know that, right? But functional programmers take this even further because you can have, you can have a list of two strings and a second list of two strings, and you can do exactly the same, exactly the same thing with them. You, you can like, concatenate them. Of course, the, na the name of the function is different, appended all from the second one, but the, you know, the technique is exactly the same. You get a new value, a, b is the same, c, d is the same, nothing changed. And, and when you look at the REPL, you see that it produces, if, it, if we don't name the value, it produces automatic naming, like rest 9, rest 10, and we can kind of like create new values out of previous values and so on and so forth. So this is immutable world, this is declarative world in practice, functional programming in practice. Our programs is just you know, creating new values until the end of the world. And of course, uh, we, we also have like head, how to take a head of a, of, a, of a list, like the first element of a list, right? In imperative programs, you just had, say head and that's it. So here in the, in the functional programming, when you want to take a head of of this AB list, you say head option. Because, you know, some lists are empty, right? So the, like the function needs to tell you exactly what's happening, uh, what may happen. So that's, that's the option type. Option models a value that may not be there. So if you have an empty list, let's, last, last thing here, an empty list, uh, which is a list of strings, list, and we say head option, nothing blows up, no exceptions, we just get an option string, you see? This is a value of the same type. So we can kind of like use that to our advantage, but this is immutable value, cannot change. It was produced and won't change ever. So declarative versus imperative, it's not really an opposition. It's, it's like two worlds that we can learn from both, and we can learn from both of them. And most importantly, we can expose ourselves to those uh, techniques, tools, and uh, things in the other world by using the tools that they provide, right? And of course, if you are a, a software engineer that just starts uh, their journey and you start with Python, uh, you miss out because you don't really see the difference between creating values and printing values. It's very hard then to get back on track if you do that this way. So let's, let's kind of like learn more from this functional paradigm. We are imperative programmers, so let's learn. Let's see how the other paradigms use those techniques in real programs, because that's what's important. What's important. Not lists, not options, right? Not strings, but like real, real world programs. So we'll rigorously analyze values and produce programs by doing just that without operational reasoning. And let's start by comparing, by comparing what we have in imperative world with what we have in functional world, which you probably already know the difference, but let's just you know, recap so we are on the same page. So here's uh, a list, xs, it's a one, two, three, four, five list, and then we create a new list result, which is empty. And then we go through the original XS list and add a result of doubling the, the, the elements in their list. And we get 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Easy, right? But the important, here, the important bit here is why do we need this empty list? It's definitely not in our business requirements in this example, right? It's just a technique that we learn to use as, a, as imperative programmers. So that, that's why like functional declarative world has the different approach. We just you know, create a new value doubles out of the old values, a value numbers. And we do that by just providing a function that maps them. And nothing changes, it's just a new value that is created uh, out of the old one, right? So that's, that's the difference. We have value in and some value out. And uh, more, more advanced examples. So we'll be uh, stepping up here and leveling up up uh, in our examples. So let's see the string, the string parsing example. 
So we have this string, row TV show like The Wire, and in the brackets we see the time, the, the years that this show was on TV, like 2002 and 2008. And now we want to have a functionality that parses the year start and the year end out of, out of these strings. So in, in Java we could say something like, okay, extract year start, extract year end, and that returns an int, and of course throws an exception if something's not parsable. And for this simple example, it works fine. But what if we provide uh, another example, like Chernobyl? It was a mini series, like one season, just, just 2019, so no start and just a single year. Right? That, that's, that's possible. Right. Well, what happens here when we pass Chernobyl, it just blows up, right? So it's uh, not great, and uh, it is terrible because following exceptions is in this. Uh, in this kind of like, world, it's very, very difficult. This is a simple example, so probably it would be fine, but you know, you, I'm sure you, you've, seen, you've seen code bases that were created like that, and there were like, you know, levels, layers of layers of layers of those kinds of things, and it, it was very hard to kind of like keep up with what, what's happening. So machine, machines like computers can do better than us in those in those statements by statement fashions, right? That's why, that's why uh, like assembly languages is done like that because it's for CPUs, it's for machines. It's not for humans because like, kind of like doing these kind of what can happen here, how to recover from this exception or that exception, it's hard, it's taxing for our programmers' mind. So in order to kind of like do this functionality in this kind of like way we would need probably to just first try to extract year start and then maybe s extract single year. Uh, so doing like, again, statement by statement, like if this doesn't happen, then let's try this uh, thing out. And this is operational reasoning, thinking like a machine. While in functional programming, the, sa the same example is just using options, right? So extract year start, will return an option. Value may or may not be there. The same for year start, there's the, the same for single year. So you see that there's not much difference in, in, in this uh, area. The difference is how we create a new value out of old one, because this is exactly what I just showed you in this try-catch recovery uh, statements. This one line of code is just extract year start or else extract single year. It's, a, it's a exp an expression that creates a new value out of two old ones. So that's the paradigm, right? We focus on what is it, what this value is, what this year value is. It is a value that is created out of two different other values, and they can't change. While in the machine approach, the Im imperative world approach, we need to kind of like follow what does it do. What does it do here? What does it do here? And most importantly, what this thing like in the past did that applies right here. So going back to Dijkstra and what he said in this uh, letter, it's important to see the differences between the paradigms and learn from them, right? Because even if we don't use those things in our day-to-day -day life and job, of course, um, it will shape our thinking habits. It will shape us as programmers, make us better Programmers, we train ourselves uh, to use the tools and they shape us. So we don't have to think like machines, but there are some benefits. Like even last month, uh, Brian Getz, the Java language architect at Oracle, wrote this, uh, this wonderful article about data-oriented programming in Java. What's coming in Java, what's coming into Java very soon or, or has already landed. So, you know, we have... Uh, reactive APIs, we have streams, we have pattern matching, structured concurrency in a pro project loom, right? So all those things that we've learned about uh, in the past in, in the functional pr uh, paradigm, they are coming into other paradigms as well. So we are in fact kind of like merging, right? Uh, getting the best out of two, uh, two worlds. So it's very important to learn about, sorry, to learn about those things, um, you know, if we can right now, it will be easier next time. So the, those, all those ideas are exactly like the same at core. It's just passing immutable values uh, around. So always the same output for the same input. Okay. 
lists, strings, options, parsing. Uh, it's just kind of like working in one single pro like program, right, in memory. Nothing is really happening. So very simple examples. I appreciate that. So let's talk to the outside world. So let's step up and let's see uh, like a reward program. And what, what I'm showing you here is really what we are doing in our, uh, in our jobs as functional programmers. Uh, those are exactly the techniques we are using to make those applications. And to fit in, into, a, in, into a talk slide, I came up with this uh, example. So we will create a travel guide, like a very specific, peculiar tra travel guide. User can search for an attraction, like tourist attraction, right? And the application we will write will find its attraction, find its location, and return movies that were set in this location, about this location. As an example, if the user uh, searches for bridge of sites, the application that we will write will find the bridge of sites is in Venice, and then we'll look for movies that were shot in Venice and, and return, for example, Casino Royale as, an, as something to watch before going to uh, see bridge of sites, right? So travel guide. Um, and we'll start with a model. Model, of course, are immutable values. So location ID is just an immutable value for uniquely identifying the location. Uh, location has a name, like Venice, and an ID, of course. Attraction has a name, Bridge of Sights, for example, and is located in a location, which is Venice. And, of course, we have Movie, which has a name, and some box office earnings, right? So we, we can see uh, like what movie is more popular or, or earned more money. And, of course, the final output of our program will be a travel guide, an attraction, and a list of movies. That's the whole model. We won't change it, just use it. And we will use Wikidata. Wikidata, who used use Wikidata? Like, and, uh, it's, it's, it's the knowledge base behind Wiki, uh, Wikipedia. And you can query it, like from your computers, we'll query it right now, like, like using the internet. Uh, the API is open. Like, of course, you have some request limits, but you know, for your own use, fair use, it's, uh, it's open. And it has some query language, which is SparkQL for uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge based parsing uh, or fetching data from, from these kind of uh, databases. Uh, so this is not important. But you can, you can look at it as, an, uh, as something similar to SQL or any other, like, any other data storage you use, right? Because the ideas are exactly the same. We just use this one as an open database uh, available for everyone. And we'll use Apache Gina which is exactly like the, the framework, Java framework for building semantic web and linked data. And that's on purpose. I'd like to show you, like I chose the most imperative library there can be, and we'll use it functionally. So I can show you that, uh, that it's, it's really, really possible to, to connect those two words together. So we'll use Apache Gina. And I will show you first how the imperative usage of this API, of this library, uh, looks like. So, of course, we have a query. It doesn't matter. This one just provides free random tourist locations, tourist attractions, sorry. And uh, we create a, a connection. Uh, again, HTTPS, query, Wikidata, org. This is what we'll use, so a real one. Then we need to have a query execution, and then we have this exec select, which provides an iterator of query solutions. And, of course, while it has an next solution, we just parse some ID, some label, and print it out. And in my case, it was Yellowstone, Eiffel Tower, and Table Mountain. Again, uh, when, you, uh, will, uh, when you will execute it at your com in your computer, uh, I will provide the, call, the source code uh, at the end. Uh, then probably you will have a different, different set of uh, tourist attractions. And uh, in the immutable world, in this non-machine thinking, like rigorous thinking, functional paradigm, we'll have something different. We don't really do those statement by statement parsing and, and creating connections, we have, a, we have a value, that immutable value, that describes the program. Okay, this is, this is when, it, when it's getting a bit tricky, but uh, the important bit here is that we have a value that describes a program. 
So it, it, it describes a program that hasn't been run yet. It describes a program done pro that produces here a list of query solutions when we'll execute it later. I will show you uh, how to execute or run this value later on because it's not important to run it as early as that. We can create this value by using the delay uh, functionality. And again, you see connection query is the Apache Gina. We can use Java from Scala. So this is exactly the same what I showed you in the Java version, but we wrap it in IO delay. IO delay doesn't, doesn't run the code. It's just like a closure. It's just a block of code that it stores inside the value and keeps it there. And, uh, and that's it. So we have this value, IO of list of query solutions. This is a value that describes a program done that, when executed, will provide a list of query solutions. And that's that. It's nothing, nothing has been uh, run. Not, no query has been executed. So what we can do with that? Like, if we print line, we have the solutions program, this value that we create by, cre by calling this function, exec query, with a query that produces free random two result directions I just showed you. What will happen when we print line, like print this solutions program? Who knows? We are printing a solutions program, more or less. Will we get free two result directions? No, it, it will print just that. It's I.O. of something. I don't know what. It's, it's a code, block of code that I have stored, but haven't really run it. And so, so this is just the value. Again, we haven't run anything, and that's important. Because, like with lists, like with strings and options and all those things before, we can just get this value and produce a new value out of it, right? Here, we can get this IO of list of query solutions and create an attractions program, IO of list of attractions. Attraction is the model that, that our model, not query solution from Apache Gina, which we need to parse and you get the literals and all those nasty things. We have this attraction model at hand, so we can, we can transform the result of the program without running a program, right, by mapping. So here's attractions program is a solutions program mapped with uh, parse attraction uh, function that parses the attraction out of the query solution. So we can transform values without running them. That's without having them at least. And, but but we, can, we can just think about what should happen and not care about running it, not thinking operationally, thinking about relationships between values. So value in solutions program, I.O. of list of query solutions, value out, attractions program, I.O. of list of attractions, nothing has been run yet. So let's do a demo, and I will do a recap of, of, of all those things that I just showed you, because this is, this is the connection, so that, that's the program that I will run. We will really run something and, and get from Wikidata. So here's the connection uh, created unsafely. Here's the exec query function that is important uh, for us. So it's IO delay again. So that's how we create this value. And here's this connection query uh, from, from Apache Gina. Then, 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 then there's this query. And here are our IO, IO values. Again, solutions program is a, uh, is a value. Again, nothing happens when we print it. And attractions program is a new value created out of the old value by mapping the results that we don't have yet with this parse attraction function that uh, just parses a attraction out of query solution using the pattern I showed you with TV shows earlier on, right, with, uh, with options. So no, nothing, is, nothing is really uh, thrown as an exception. So what we can do now, we have this attractions program, a value, and we, have, we, can, we can run it just, just out of, you know, for the sake of completeness. We can, we can run it in IO program by, by, do, by doing unsafe run sync here. It's just a technicality, but the, 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 thing, is, the thing is that we, uh, we kind of like delay running these things until the end of the program. This is where we choose our thread pools. This is where we choose every like, uh, technical detail that, that's important uh, to run it. 
So this will happen very, very late in the program, uh, outside of your core of the arch architecture, or your essential complexity. But that, that's, how we, that's how we do it. And uh, more importantly, if we run this, this program and get an attraction, a list of attractions back, we can still reuse the same value because attractions program is still there. It's a value. It's immutable. It, doesn't, it hasn't changed. Uh, so we can, we can still map it. So we can have an attractions, uh, attractions program mapped with... Uh, so re results of the, this program can be mapped to head option, and we'll get a new program, attraction program, that returns only a single attraction, not three of them or, or a list of them, right? Again, just one value in, one value out, and nothing happens. We can also do more things, like we have, can have lists of programs. So we can have a list of attraction, like two programs that do the same thing. And, and uh, yeah, that's, again, a list of I.O. of option attraction, a mouthful. And for a newcomer, it's, it's like the most hideous thing ever, right? Uh, but as uh, with everything, we are getting used to, used to it. And the, the nice thing about it, it really like, tell, tells you what it is, right? It's a list of programs that, re that when run, will return an option of attraction. Just by looking at it, you know what, what happens. But of course, you have a list of independent uh, programs, and you don't really want to go through lists and run them. Uh, you can have a uh, different one. So we can have a, if, if you have a list of programs, you can sequence them so that they are run one after another, and you get a program of lists, right? So a program that will run all those independent programs and re re return the res result as a list. So that's how you, that's how you do those, those, those things. So let's, let's run this, this final program uh, that, should return, that should return a list. Uh, yeah, this is querying Wikidata. Let's see uh, how the internet connection is here and, and see what happens. So that's, that's uh, using uh, exec query. That's uh, using I.O. values and transforming them, uh, transforming them using map and all those functional uh, stuff. And you can see this is the first print that we did. And then we get a list of attraction, Yellowstone, uh, Yellowstone, and some, yeah, something in Moscow. And uh, th that's, that's, that's it. Like, we just queried a real, a real Wikidata service. And now we can, we can create a function that does our travel guide. So uh, to do that, and it will be very straightforward, I think. We'll just use uh, this data, data access. So we have functions. For our querying like storage, we have these functions. I, I just showed you how to do an attractions, right? You have a query. You just provide an I.O. of list of attractions. And that's exactly that. So we have a pure function that returns a program that returns attractions. And we have a, and exactly the same. I, will, I won't bore you with that. Uh, again, uh, some SparkQL query underneath. But from the perspective of user, you don't really know about SparkQL here at all, right? You just see a program that will get you what you need. And, and underneath can be whatever, right? It will get you a list of movies when you provide the location ID. So let's, let's use that. And of course, user needs to provide an attraction name. You can, you can kind, of, kind of like see what, what, is, what is happening. This function, this application, because this function will be the whole travel guide. And we won't, we, we won't be changing it at all. It's, uh, it will provide an option of travel guide. Because you know, a user provides a string. Can f can we can find something or, or not? Here we 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 probably would just uh, provide bridge of sight, so we'll find something. And yeah, we'll use the the function, this, the find attractions function uh, that I just showed you, the one that will query the wiki data. But from the perspective of this travel guide, you don't you don't care again. Uh, we just say attraction name and just let's hit the one, and then we can we can map attractions again. What we are doing is we are mapping results of a program that hasn't been run yet. And we can just get a head option here. So we are transforming I.O. values. We are transforming programs. So here, that was an I.O. of list of attractions. Now we mapped it with a head option. And it will be 
an IO of, I will just show you here, yeah, without the completion error, IO of option of uh, car, because, that's <laughs> because I, I just had op optioned the uh, wrong thing, IO of option of attraction, right? So we have an, a different value describing a different program that returns only a single attraction if found. And then we can map, ag map it again and say, OK, maybe attraction. The option of attraction, we, 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 say we name it maybe attraction. And uh, maybe attraction is if we find an attraction, like if there is an attraction, we can map it, map it with, a, uh, with the function. So option has a map as well. We can say attraction, and of course, we can find movies about this location because n right now we have an attraction location ID. We we have a single movie, and, and this is a program that this is a program that we are getting. So let's see what's the what's the output. What, let the type again. We are solving a puzzle here, you know, because the the signature says that we need to return an option of travel guide, but we have an I/O of option of I/O of this movie, right? And mouthful again. But what we can do here is we can we can just uh, map it, map it again. This is a maybe a program, maybe a program, and we can map it with the sequence that we just uh, heard about, and this is and uh, this will return I/O of I/O, so we can flat it, flatten it. And that's it. And we just implemented the travel guide by just rigorously thinking about values, uh, values representing programs. And that's that's how we that's that's the, the whole version. So it will do exactly that. Bridge of Sides, Venice, and we'll see what movies it will uh, it will show us. So again, version one of travel guide, we we just say Bridge of Sides, Sides. Let's uh, let's uh, run it. Let's run the uh, the first version. Uh, if uh, we Get the the right uh, the right amount of okay yeah so here we don't really have so compiler helped us we don't really have a travel guide here right we just have movies so uh, in order to get a travel guide we need to we need to map it again and create this travel guide with the attraction sorry attraction and the movies so yeah compiler compiler helped us uh, they they couldn't really work out this one, and now it, it could. Again, we just mapped another thing because you know, value in, value out. Okay, let's see what the Wikidata says about our trial guide. Yeah, bridge of sites, location Venice, again from Wikidata, and unfortunately, uh, uh, yeah, Casino Royale is not there anymore, so we just uh, see uh, Spider-Man Far From Home because uh, it's one of the more pop most popular movies that were shot in uh, in, in Venice, so that's how it that's how it works. And yeah, so this is this is travel guide. This is the the travel guide that we that we uh, implemented using just immutable values. I understand it may be kind of like difficult to follow the the types, but this is how it really uh, works. So let's see how we can even get it on the on the higher level with threats, threats, resource safety, and state. So not only talking to the outside world, like Wikidata, but also doing some things that we need to do, like, like having multiple threads running our show or uh, like finalizing some, some resources, and of course having a state. So here, let's format it, and uh, let's, let's start by doing, doing something different. We have this limit of one, so we just find one attraction and one movie for each attraction. So let's just copy the, the, the solution here to not repeat ourselves. And just say another. Let's do another version with uh, some like free attractions, and and free movies, right? And of course, we don't want to have a head op option now. We just want to map attractions. So here's the list of uh, list of attractions, and for each attraction, uh, so we we have this list of attractions, and we need to map the list of attractions into lists of of travel guides for these attractions, and this is how we. This is how we do it. Like exactly, this is the, the expression that, that will, will do it. So we are transforming a list of attractions into a list of travel guides for these, for these attractions uh, with some, with some uh, program that needs to find movies. So in order to get rid of this program, we, we again say sequence, uh, sequence here, and we'll get, we'll get exactly what we need. We get an IO of list of travel guides, but our signature says IO of option of travel guide. Right? 
So we need to, to have a map, map the list into, a, uh, into something different, and an option. And in order to do that, we, in functional programming, we just create a new function. A new function that takes a list and returns an option. And this is a business logic, right? No I.O., no like, like checking something in the internet or in the database. We just have a list of travel guides. We sort it by the movies, like amount of movies each of them have, has, and reverse it to get the, uh, the one with the biggest amount on top, and we just return an option of, of, the, of this list, right? And that's how we, that's how we create and that's how we create the, the program. Of course, we need to flatten this one as well. So that's, again, that's a program that finds three attractions, and for each of those attractions, uh, goes through movies and, and chooses the one with the biggest amount of movies. So everything I just said is just by uh, transforming one value into another using this, this, uh, this travel guide. Let's remove this line. So that's the, the, the second version. I, I, I will run it, but in a different, uh, in a different a slightly different uh, way or version, because uh, sequence, what it does, again, when I showed you uh, sequence here, it transforms a list of programs into a, a program of lists, right? But it does it by getting one program run, uh, executed, adding the result to the, uh, to, to the list, and, and for each program that is executed, it adds the, uh, the, the thing to the list. So it's, it does it sequentially. And that's why if we run this functionality, it will first run the, the query for attractions, and then for each attraction, run a query, run a query, run a query, even though they are independent. So what we can do is we can run them on a thread pool. And, uh, and we don't really say that on a thread pool because it doesn't matter, and we don't really have any thread pool at this point because it's just operating on values. But what we can say, instead of sequence, we can say parse sequence. So we just, we just are saying that those values are, are, are you know, independent, right? Those are independent programs. Let's run them uh, independently. And then when we run it, they will be run on, on, on different, on different uh, threads, in different threads. So that's how it that's how it works. That's that's it. In terms of uh, multi multi threading, we do exactly the same thing: mapping, 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 and parse sequencing at the end to have the the program that runs on multiple threads. Uh, yeah, and of course there are more different difficult problems to solve, like uh, the connection that we were creating unsafely, like Apache Gina connection. That's I showed you at the beginning, but let's recap. It's it's doing that. It creates a connection. So it's a resource, right? We need to close this resource. Everybody knows that, that we need to uh, finalize the resource. We need to, if we acquire something that is finite, we need to kind of like release it after uh, we are done. Even if it's a problem or, uh, or we, are, we have our successful path or problematic path, we need to release the, the connection to the world. And we haven't been doing so, like by running here, I need to remember. Of course, we are programmers, we are human beings. We will forget one, uh, one day, and uh, no production outages don't uh, don't come as a surprise if you think about it uh, closely. So we need to have something that will kind of like hold our hand, and we have something like that uh, in in functional programming called resource, right? So we say that uh, there is a value that describes a a resource that is acquirable and releasable. So that's that how that's how I/O uh, describes a program that has side effects. Uh, exactly in the same manner we have this resource value that, that uh, describes a finite resource that we need to acquire to use and release after we are done. And that's exactly, uh, don't, don't really let's, let's not dive into how it's created. Uh, the important bit here is that we have this value that represents this. And we, we just created by providing two programs. The first program creates the describes a program that creates the, 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 the connection here, and the second one closes the connection after it's done. And in order to use it, we have this use function on, on the resource that returns an I.O. So we provide a function that uses this connection and returns an I.O. of program, and the resource takes care of everything. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't leak. So we have here we have a function from connection into I.O. So we have a function uh, that uses our travel guide 
Uh, again, have a look. This is exactly the same travel guide. We, we are not changing the business logic. We are not changing how our travel guide works. We are now just changing a bit around it, right? So we are just uh, having now this resource safety in place because uh, we use connection, uh, we connection resource, but our travel guide hasn't, hasn't changed. So that's how we use the resource value. And exactly the same with the state that, is, uh, that can be used by multiple threads. We have a value to describe that. And let's, let's not go into details of, of, uh, sorry, of exactly that. But this is a cached exec query version. So it uses cache. If we have like 100 programs that do the same thing, we, uh, we can have a cache. And cache here is the line that we, we should, uh, we should uh, kind of like focus on here. It's an, an ref of uh, I.O., the same I.O. that we've been using, and it contains a map of string to list of query solutions. So it has a map of a query to a list of query uh, solutions that we already have run and got results for. And it doesn't matter how it works. It's just value in, value out. But it's, it's very important how we use it. Again, we have this connection resource that hasn't changed. But we now have a new value that, uh, that, that has an map, empty map at the beginning. And we just use a new cached, cached exec query version for our wiki data, data access. I, I told you at the beginning that it really doesn't matter, right? We have just two functions. One of them gets attractions. Second one of, the, of them gets uh, movies. And we don't care how. And th that's exactly why. So we don't really uh, care how, because right now we just use the same travel guide function that we uh, wrote. And now it uses, uses cache, cache underneath. So we can, run, we can run 100 of those programs and sequence them into one program. And we won't hit any limits because this is exactly the same program. So it will be cached. Let's run it. Uh, again, we are running against the real uh, Wikidata, but with cache. Let's run the the program 100 times. This is the first execution, and we'll, we should get here. You see? We got a program that's, that's run 100 times, the same program, but only the first time was really real database, sorry, data storage hit, and then the rest uses, used cache. And again, it doesn't matter really what you see here. It's just value in, value out. Uh, we, can, we can kind of like look at it from a different perspective. Uh, again, uh, I will, I will uh, hint you some, some resources at the end of the talk where to go next to kind of like learn more about doing, doing things this way. The important uh, bit here is that we can do everything that we need to do to solve our business problems in using this rigorous thinking value in, value out. And of course, I, I appreciate it's not natural to, uh, to many of us uh, at the beginning. Nothing is, right? Um, but again, you can kind of like get, to use, get used to that. And uh, you know, we have examples like extreme APIs and reactive APIs that kind of like follow this path, right? Uh, transforming values instead of running things uh, in the background. So what it is versus what does it do? Not the violin that shapes the violinist, but, but the tools that we train ourselves to use. And of course, if we go back to 2022, and, and compare Java 1.3 from 2001 with what we have right now. There are two different, totally two different languages because uh, it has been uh, evolving, right? And uh, lots of functional goodies uh, in Java as well. So lots of those techniques are already in, uh, in Java, uh, ready to use, and more are to come, as I showed you at the beginning with this, uh, with this article. And of course, this example, uh, uh, shameless plug, sorry about that. This example is taken from the book. Like it's, it's a simplified version of the one that we have in the book, Rocking Functional Programming, when we take step fr from the beginning, very simple like string uh, lists approach and very real world uh, applications and programs. And this, uh, this, what I just showed you is at the end of, of the book. So it's really what we, what we learn uh, throughout the book and at the end we just it all just comes together and we can create real, r real programs. And uh, please have a look. Or if you have some friend that asks about resources, I think this is a great resource to, to get them started. Uh, please consider uh, 
clocking functional programming. Image of values, pure functions, ADTs, pattern matching, everything uh, is there. And of course, it's coming to Java as well. So please go ahead and take, take a look. Everything uh, I just showed you, a code, links, slides, book information, the code uh, for the book is uh, the QR code here at my, at my site. Please have a look. And of course, contact me there as well, uh, or on Twitter, on, or, during, or using the application, uh, the conference application. And please, uh, uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions, comments, feedback. I'm open uh, for questions right now. We have like three minutes left. Uh, if not, then just please catch me in the hallways. And thank you very much. My name is Michał. This was Immutability Against the Machine. Thank you. So uh, mics are open if anyone has a question. I'll come, I'll come. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, you. You were using I.O. Like, to defer the execution of, uh, the, uh, of the code, of the call. Uh, how different from a uh, supplier is that, from a Java supplier? Yeah, so this, uh, like the technique is exactly the same. Like you, you are, def as, I, as you say, you are deferring a block of code until next time. What's different is that you have all those maps, flat maps, all those functional goodies that are, uh, that are together with, with, with I.O. And, and of course, the sequence, parse sequence, all those things I, sh I showed you, like transforming a list of IOs into IO lists. So you have all those pure functions that can help you transform your value in different ways so that you can have those programs that are just transformations of values. So, but, but the idea is, you're right, exactly the same. It's, it's an old idea. Yeah. So uh, is this is uh, IO is from Scala? Or from yeah, so I, I, I didn't want to kind of like show you exactly what, what it is. It's a cat's effect library from, from Scala, but we have, uh, in Kotlin, we have Arrow, we, ha we have uh, different IOs even. Uh, the idea here is exactly the same. We, have, we, we need to defer something and just transform it in, in some way or another, right? So of course, the function names are, are different, not map, map is always the same, but you know, the, the names of the functions are different between languages and libraries, but the idea is exactly the same. Like you just transform values, and be it Haskell, be it Scala, Kotlin, anything like that. If you do functional programming, you do just that. Uh, but it's cat, cat effect in Scala. Uh, yeah, very popular one, one of the most popular. Yeah. Thanks. More questions. Hello. Um, I kind of catch everything that you tried to show, but it's hard to follow. I mean, if you show me this code uh, and I need to co-review it, I'm going to be pretty lost because I think you lose a lot of readability. So I don't know if it's worth it. Uh, perfect question. Yeah, de definitely. Definitely, uh, we, uh, we have some additional things that we can use in order to improve read readability. One of them is naming each, each step of the way, right? So instead of doing data uh, find attractions attraction uh, name, I, I was showing you I a list of attraction, I could just name it a program, attractions program. So that's one way we can improve readability. And I, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really do that here, but maybe uh, I would do a different thing. Like in the book, uh, when you look at the examples from the book, which are also open uh, to public, we do, uh, we do it differently. So the travel guide from chap chapter 11, uh, we, we implement it using the for comprehension. And this is exactly like for comprehension is what we, what we prefer. Uh, let's see the first version. So you, you, you can see, yeah, you can see that we have this uh, attractions name, named and guides uh, using this not flat mapping and nesting, but using the, the for comprehension. Um, so it's underneath its flat maps and maps. I didn't want to show you, uh, show you that here. I can now uh, when you ask. But exactly, this is how the parsing, parsing looks. Uh, so again, this is flat maps and maps underneath. In Scala, we have for comprehension. In Haskell, it's a do notation. But to your point, like to improve readability, to name things as we go, 
each transformation, we have some syntax sugar to help us with that. Is there something similar in Java? Uh, not, not yet, <laughs> at least. Thank you. Thanks. Great question. All right, we're out of time, so thank you very much. And grab me in the hallway, ask questions. Thank you very much again. <laughs>